Hey everyone, it's Susan Pierce Thompson and welcome to the weekly vlog. I want to do a vlog today uh, that's like a sequel to the vlog that I did back in September that was called The Jumping Off Point. And that vlog, The Jumping Off Point, got more comments, more shares, more, it just, more views. It just generated more engagement and feedback than any vlog I'd ever put out. Um, if you saw it, you know what I'm talking about. If you didn't see it, it was um, super emotional and it was about some struggles that I'd been having in my marriage and about a point that I came off came to where I was um, thinking that I was ready to end my marriage. And um, that didn't happen. My husband and I reunited and I talked about how that relates to the Bright Line Eating journey in terms of reaching a point where you, you realize that what you're doing is not working with food and you're ready to jump off into the unknown, into some kind of other future. And that's where David and I came to in our marriage, where we really um, were ready to jump off the ledge into a more deeply connected, more profoundly fulfilling relationship. And I'm happy to say that, that we've done that and it's, it's awesome. Um, and it's going well. And I just wanted to create a vlog to tell sort of a second chapter of that story. So, um, one of the things that I talked about in that old vlog, um, was, uh, some of the ways that I had been dissatisfied in my marriage. And I talked about, um, feeling like I was asking it for and needing, uh, more connection, some verbal, um, praise and compliments and things like that. I told this story about how in the past I'd asked him for a compliment and he hadn't given me one. And, um, anyway, I think it created the impression in some people that, um, my husband is some kind of, um, ogre or something. Someone in the, in the comments wrote anyway, not, not many people actually. I think a lot of people wrote in saying that they felt really bad for David after hearing that vlog. Um, because, um, yeah, because he's a sweet guy and I was ready to leave him, which is, um, you know, we, we've been happily married for 17 years. So, um, you know, the phrase happily married is interesting, right? It's, uh, as I started off that vlog by saying my marriage was sort of, um, two things. It was on the one hand, super happy for 17 years. And on the other hand, there was this strain of dissatisfaction in me that ran through the marriage. What I didn't talk about in that vlog is David's side of that story at all. And, you know, I guess that's fine and appropriate. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a vlog about presenting both sides of that situation. It was a vlog about something else, but it was noteworthy to me. And of course to him that I told a poignant story about a way that he had let me down in the past. And there are poignant stories about ways that I have let him down in the past. And none of that got any airtime. And one of the especial wounds that has existed in our marriage for David is that he has chronically felt discounted, not heard, not seen, not factored in, of lower importance than other things. And I have created that feeling in him over the years, systematically, slowly, not meaning to, but absolutely doing it. And um, an example of this, it was chronic. An example of this is for my 40th birthday, I decided that I wanted to climb Half Dome. This was another one of my morning meditation uh, visitations. I was in my morning meditation. It was about six months before I was about to turn 40. And it just came to me in my morning meditation, climb Half Dome for your 40th birthday. And I decided I was going to do it. And I talked on the phone with a bunch of friends and I invited a couple friends to go. And I never talked to David about it. I mean, for a couple of days, for a few days. I had invited other people. I never mentioned it to David. He heard about it as I was in the kitchen preparing dinner and talking with a friend and inviting her. And he was sitting in the living room just going, hmm, this is interesting. Sounds like my wife has cooked up an idea. Wonder when she's going to tell me about it. And I didn't for days. And he just kind of hung around going, is she going to invite me? Is she going to ask if she can go because if she goes that means I'm staying home with the kids for however long she's gone like I got to get factored in here at some point and I started to notice that he was acting grumpy or whatever and I was like hey are you all right and he's like well I hear there's a half dome thing happening and I'm just kind of wondering when you're going to tell me about it and I was like oh 
right, okay. Um, and at that point, some time had passed and he was feeling pretty like, yeah, like uh, left out, hello. And um, I sensed the depth of his feeling around that and it made me back up, reassess and realize actually it would be really fun to climb Half Dome with David. And so I invited him and we went and it was wonderful. But that long chunk of time where I didn't even think of him was an example of the systemic ways that I had placed all kinds of things in my life above him and was just not giving him pride of place in my life. And within that context, he who's very much a man's man wasn't feeling psychologically safe to traverse uncharted, uncomfortable psychological waters to learn how to express, you know, emotions, gratitude, appreciation in ways that were foreign to him. Like, like why in that context, when he can tell that he's sixth, seventh, eighth on my list of priorities, would he stretch himself to shower me with affection? Um, and so we created over the years this sort of downward spiral where I wasn't giving him pride of place in my life, making him feel very left out and discounted. And within that environment, he wasn't showing up to appreciate me or, 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 or have deep conversations with me. And because he wasn't showing up to have deep conversations with me, and that's sort of the, the fabric of my life, I was having all my deep conversations elsewhere, which was making me more connected to other people, more um, seeking my fulfillment outside of the marriage, which again, put other people, other things in the top spots of my my priorities because that's where I get my my juice is deep connection and I wasn't getting into my marriage and I'd asked him for that and he wasn't ponying up so I was getting it elsewhere but in that context again downward spiral why would he show up for that when I'm hardly giving him the time of day and leaving the house and you know barely telling him where I'm going you know so we had created an environment in which we were really skillfully running a household together raising kids together but really too distant and not deeply connecting. So there was a lot that I was contributing to that and a lot that he was contributing to that. And after our marriage came to a head around Labor Day last year, in late August and then and then right around Labor, not last year, this year, <laughs> a couple months ago, um, after that all came to a head, we had to look at like, how did we get to this jumping off point? And what do we want to do now? And David was the one who stepped up and said, I don't want a divorce, I wanna be with you. I wanna be with you, I wanna be with our daughters, I want our family above all else, and I will do whatever it takes. And he has ponied up on that. So now every single night, we have a connection ritual that has four components to it. The first thing is we say prayers together. He says a prayer, I say a prayer. The next step is, we talk about what went well that day. And this is a very famous gratitude exercise that I've already talked about in this vlog just recently, um, the day before Thanksgiving, about what went well, looking at the good, systematically finding the good. And if we didn't spend all of the day together, we get to hear about some of the things that the other person did that day that went well. Then we appreciate each other. We just look eye to eye and we say things like, I appreciate that you gave the kids a bath tonight. I appreciate that um, you took my car to the shop. I appreciate that sweet kiss you gave me earlier because it was so tender. You know, I appreciate the conversation that we had earlier. I really needed to talk. I appreciate, I appreciate, I appreciate. We just go back and forth until we've exhausted everything we can think about. And then we take out a journal and we write the date and we write, what do I want? Question mark. And we do some visioning work about what we want. Big things, little things not necessarily material things, like um, just what we want in our lives together, just building a future together. What do we want in this world? There's so many choices, options, what do we want? Every night we do that. We have not missed once since Labor Day. I'm not even kidding. So one of the things that was in that vlog of the jumping off point was I was talking about my attraction to other people 
and how that comes really naturally to me. It always has. Um, I was um, super into, I was boy crazy from a very young age, super into relationships, very promiscuous in my teenage years. Of course, if you know my story, you know there was a lot of drugs and alcohol in the mix. That fueled that for sure. Um, but I think it also came naturally to me. I've always been super extroverted, super flirty, super playful, and um, yeah, and promiscuous. And then I got married in a monogamous context and um, my husband reminded me that um, I think we weren't quite married yet. We were in an airport somewhere. Apparently we were in the Chicago airport um, or somewhere. And, um, and I told him, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do the, the faithfulness thing. I'm probably gonna go on a trip sometime and sleep with somebody, like just so you know. Um, I, I can't picture myself really being faithful forever. Um, that's gonna be a hard one for me. So, so I told him, like he had fair warning. Um, man, I was doing my best, right? Just in this monogamous marriage. And what came out this past um, summer was I think I might be polyamorous. Like I think I might be wired to not feel fulfilled on the deepest level unless I'm having relationships with multiple people. That's not a popular thing to say publicly, but I'm saying it. Like I, I was really suspecting that that might be true for me. And here I am in this monogamous marriage. So all of these things came out over Labor Day is, you know, I think I might be polyamorous and I don't, not sure that I want to be married to you and I'm deeply unhappy in this relationship and blah, blah, blah. So what David said was, I want to be married to you. Full stop. And polyamory scares me. Let's put that into the future for now because having relationships with other people, if we're not having a good relationship with each other, is a very different thing than if we are. So let's focus on building the foundation for a solid marriage together first. And we'll talk about polyamory on March 1st. Let's put it into the spring. And I said, okay, that makes sense. So we put that conversation off. And we focused on our nightly connection ritual and just loving and being loved and it's been good. And David would tell me sometimes, is it okay that my secret goal is to be such a good husband that you would never wanna be with anyone else? And I was like, yeah, that's okay, <laughs> that's okay. So we toodled along. I promise I'm gonna bring this back to your Bright Line Eating journey. Bear with me, there's a point. So we hired a coach to work with us. We didn't feel like we really needed therapy per se, but we wanted guidance on and like, um, yeah, a witness and a guide, someone to work with us on crafting an awesome marriage. So we hired a coach, amazing coach. And, um, and our coach gave us an assignment, which was to give each other each three gifts in the two weeks before we met up with our coach again. David gave me some amazing gifts, really sweet gifts. And um, I was thinking about my gifts to him and um, I had an idea. And it had been sort of percolating in my soul for a while. And I was, I talked it over with my friends, my support group. People were like, that's a big step, are you sure? And I was sure. So here's what I did. I went to the mall, to that shop that sells, you know, tchotchkes that you can give to people and engrave them, you know, to commemorate occasions or whatever. And um, I bought a little, a little silver box, like just a little memento box, sweet little box. And on the top of the lid, I had engraved the Chinese symbol for together. And inside the box, I put, these dried rose petals. Now let me tell you about these dried rose petals. When we got married, there was a woman in our faith community that went all the way to the Holy Land in Israel and kneeled at the gravesite of the prophet who founded our religion, Baha'u'llah's gravesite. And she put her nose to his grave and she laid roses on his grave, the threshold of his grave. And she prayed for our marriage. We were getting married. This was 1999. And she was in Israel in the Holy Land. She prayed for our marriage. 
She prayed for it to be long and happy and healthy and for us to have sweet and beautiful and lovely children and to grow old and die together. She said all of these prayers for our marriage and then she took those roses back to America, back to Western New York where we live. She dried the roses and then she took the petals and she put them in an envelope and she gave them to us on our wedding day. And she said these roses were in Israel at the Holy Land. I've been praying for your marriage and I give these rose petals to you. I'd saved these rose petals in a little box on my dresser all these years, 17 years. So I took half of those rose petals and I put them in this little box. And then right around that Chinese symbol for together, I had engraved monogamously yours. And one night it was late, we were tired, but something inside me said, this is the time. So I got that box and I gave it to him and he opened up the gift wrapping and he saw what it said and I told him the story of those rose petals because that was 17 years ago. I had to refresh his memory of where those rose petals came from. They'd been on my dresser all this time. He'd long since forgotten about all that and he was, he started to cry and I said, yeah, we'll just do this monogamously. We'll forget about March 1st. We'll forget about polyamory. I'm all in. We'll just invest here. A couple weeks before that, we'd been traveling and we were at a mastermind group with Justin Livingston, brilliant businessman, entrepreneur, online information guy. He teaches people how to lead workshops and um, seminars and retreats and things like that. But he has a mastermind group um, that's got, I don't know, some 30, 40 people in it who um, meet together regularly to talk about how to spread a message, grow a tribe, you know, do all this stuff that I'm doing here with Brightline Eating just to, you know, get the word out about some kind of special thing that will help change the world. And he's really, really brilliant at it. And he was talking. I always listen really carefully when Justin Livingston talks. He was talking and he said, commitment is an exclusionary process. When you commit to something, by definition, there's other things you can't do. Commitment is an exclusionary process. And um, David and I had been talking about this whole polyamory thing and we squeezed each other's knees. We were sitting next to each other. And I knew what he was thinking and he knew what I was thinking. And it was like, hmm. And you know, it's really true. I have never experienced it more than since I started doing Bright Line Eating in this big public way. Because my time has become so precious, so crunched, and I'm aware every time I say yes to a project, I'm saying no to 50 other projects. It's called opportunity cost. And if you ask Jeff Walker, another guy who teaches people how to build online businesses, it's what he says is the number one thing in being an entrepreneur is opportunity cost and managing it well. Being aware that when you say yes to something, you are saying no to other things. So pick your yeses carefully. And that relates to Bright Line Eating. Here we are in the midst of the holiday season. And if you want to eat whatever you want to eat, you can say yes to that. But be aware that when you say yes to that, you're saying no to bright line eating, to living in a right sized body, to living happy, thin and free, to having integrity with your food, to having a brain that doesn't hound you for treats and exceptions all the time. You can say yes to that thing on that platter that's going around the room with the hors d'oeuvres. You can say yes to that. You can make that choice. When you say yes to that, you're saying no to other things. Conversely, you can say yes to bright line eating. And yeah, that means you say no to those little things that are on that platter going around the room on the hors d'oeuvre tray. Every yes involves a bunch of no's. Even in the world of polyamory, you can say yes to being with two people. And that means you're saying no to spending every night with one person. 
every yes involves some no's. That's just the way it goes. I was coaching someone in Bright Lifers the other day, and she was saying that she had hesitated to get into a mastermind group. In Bright Line Eating, a mastermind group is a group, a small group, usually four people. They get together usually once a week on the phone on a free conference call line to support each other through their Bright Line Eating journeys. In my book, Bright Line Eating, The Science of Living Happy, Thin, and Free, I taught, I have a whole section on mastermind groups. I give a page where I lay out the outline for our mastermind group call. I, I'm in a mastermind group. We do it once a week. We have our call. There's a structured format. I put it in my book. Mastermind groups are a hugely central part of Bright Line Eating, of doing it well, of having enough support. And she called in and she said, I haven't ever joined a mastermind group. And I said, why not? And she said, because I'm afraid of the commitment. What if our call is on Monday nights and Monday night comes and there's something else I want to do? Or I just don't feel like being on that call. And I said, well, then you're not in a mastermind group, but you're, you're calling me because you're noticing how you need more support in your program. I said, this is just how life is, honey. Like this is, this is the way it goes. You say yes to having children. That means you're saying no to a whole bunch of free time, you know, that you're going to have to give up to raise those kids. And she said, well, I have kids. I've never had a hard time committing the time to, to raise them. I just have a hard time committing the time for myself. And I said, well, that's kind of interesting. Point taken, like that, I think the light bulb went on in her head there. But she was afraid to commit the time, but that's just, that's, commitment is an exclusionary process, absolutely. If you join a mastermind group, that means that there's an hour and a half once a week that you will not be able to do other things. Commitment is an exclusionary process and bright line eating brings that to the forefront. When you say yes to bright line eating, you are saying no to other things. And you have to decide whether that yes to bright line eating is worth it for you. And I can tell you that for me it is. I love going through holiday season, being able to put on a nice dress and feel good in it. I love going through the holiday season, not feeling awful about myself, about what I'm doing with food. I love my life and bright line eating. I'm not perfect at it, as you know, as I'm very open about. I did some math the other day. I think what I came up with is since I started this in 2003, 96.6% of my days have been perfect, squeaky clean, gorgeous, bright line days and 3.4% of my days have been not. But I say yes to Bright Line Eating today, and I say yes to David Justin Thompson today. And those yeses come with a bunch of other no's. And sometimes those no's are sad. Sometimes we miss other things. You might miss your food. You might need to grieve your food. And I invite you to make space for that grief. Those no's are poignant. There are other people that I'm not going to be with because I'm going to be with David. There are other things I'm not doing because I'm raising my kids. When I say yes to doing the Bright Line Eating business, growing this movement, I have to say no all the time. People want me to explore their products, their supplements, um, partnering with them on this project, that project. I have to say no to all that. I am doing a book launch. My book is coming out in March. We are growing the Bright Line Eating Daily Companion, which is going to be the most amazing online platform for connecting people and helping people track and monitor their progress in Bright Line Eating. It's going to be an online platform extraordinaire with an app on the mobile phone and a, and a desktop version, the whole nine yards. Those yeses require me to say no to almost everything else. My husband, my kids, growing Bright Line Eating, doing my only, own Bright Line Eating journey, it's all I can handle. So I invite you to keep in mind for today that commitment is an exclusionary process, always. When you commit to something, it means there's other things you have to give up. And creating space for the grief and the sadness and the regret about the things you're choosing not to do 
is helpful. But knowing that you're never going to get where you want to go in life if you choose not to commit to anything, that's no kind of life to live. So pick your commitments wisely and celebrate them. That's the weekly vlog. If you have something you want me to talk about on this vlog, I'm at Susan at brightlineeating.com. And I'm doing a lot of TV and radio interviews these days, and the links are getting posted on my professional Facebook page. So we're going to put a link right below this video right here that's to my professional Facebook page. If you like that page, then links to my interviews and stuff about how to navigate through the holidays. Coming up here soon, we're going to have New Year's Eve and January 1st. I'm going to be doing a lot of radio and TV interviews on goal setting, on the science of goal setting, on <clears throat> starting the, the new year right, etc. If you want those things to show up in your Facebook feed, go like my page and you'll get access to all of that free content, all of those radio interviews, etc. So go like my Facebook page and I'll see you next week.